This is our demonstration of Bomber Command. It's uh, Lee Bacombi Wood's new game. I hope I said his name right this time. <laughs> he corrected me. But uh, Brimmy Comb, that's what it was. Brimmy Comb Wood. Uh, this is Lee's new game. We'll just call him Lee. How about that? That's easy to pronounce. Uh, his new game, it's a follow on, I guess, to Night Fighter. Uh, it's a great scenario generator for Night Fighter. To be honest, there's uh, some cool new rules that he's working on that link the two games together. They're not uh, out there for the public yet, but uh, they're going to be really neat. Uh, been able to play test those a little bit recently. Uh, this game here, I would say, is a little bit more complex than Night Fighter. So if you play Night Fighter, this one I think is a little bit more complex, but it's not as complex as, say, Downtown or uh, Burning Blue. Uh, real quick, I just want to go over the maps that come with the game. This is the map for the Berlin scenario. And the game comes with two different scenarios, Berlin and Downfall. And they each have their own map. It's a full-size map sheet, meaning it's the size of a standard game map sheet, 22 by 34 inches, give or take. Uh, the, hex, the hexagons on them are large, so if you're familiar to fi with fighting formations, I would say the hexes are about that size. So these are really large hexes because there's a lot of things going on in each hex. Uh, real quick, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the map, the information on the map, and then I'll walk you through uh, a few turns of play. If you uh, want to see a planning map, I'm going to post a link here in the chat bar on Vassal. If you just plug that into your web browser, you'll download a JPEG, and that's the, uh, uh, the correct, I should say, correct planning map that we're going to use for tonight's demo. The map itself here, and again, there's two scenarios, but that it's, it sounds kind of deceptive because on the one hand, you, you hear two scenarios and think, oh, there's only two ways to play the game. Yeah, it's true, but there's a lot of variation within each scenario. So you really have a ton of scenarios on two different battlefields, put it that way. Uh, here's the, the, the map that you see here. It's got a bunch of uh, game tracks, which are, you know, obvious game turn track. Most you're going to get out of a game is 16 turns. And usually they end much faster than that. Uh, visibility track, uh, loss track, and victory points. Uh, fuel track. There's a jamming track, which is used for detection rolls. The ready box has all of the uh, fighter squadrons, that uh, the night fighter squadrons that can be used in the game. There is a closed airfield box, a rearm and refuel box. There are recovery boxes, and then there's raid boxes. And the raid boxes are basically where uh, you're going to track the damage to certain formations of bombers. There's no counters for bombers per se. Instead, you track the course of a raid or a bomber stream using raid counters or bomber stream counters like you see in the box here, the, the raid A box. Uh, on the map itself, there's a lot of symbols. Some of these things we're not going to be using tonight, like the tailwind. Um, let me use a counter here. I'm going to use this mine counter just to sh direct your attention to things on the map. Uh, we're not going to use the tailwind um, rows. That's that's for the advanced rules. Over here, you find the uh, start locations of your raids are found right here along the the perimeter of England. And these um, I forget the exact terminology they use for these. Uh, uh, looks like a plane with a an oval around it. Forget the exact terminology, but that's basically where raids will begin. And then when raids are done, they're going to go beyond the, uh, they're going to go into the recovery uh, range. They're going to go into England beyond those little uh, symbols. Night fighters can pursue up to a point, but uh, usually it's not worthwhile uh, or you're, it's real dangerous to pursue too far out into the channel because uh, you can run out of fuel and you can encounter problems that way. There's a number of, looks like, spotlights on the map. These have no effect on play ordinarily, except through the play of certain cards. Each player does have a deck of cards, and those little spotlights are going to sometimes come into play through those. But otherwise, they don't have any real function in the game. There are little mine symbols with a number inside, ranging from one up there to, I think, maybe nine way up on the uh, Baltic. Uh, those are... Uh, mining sites where if you want to send out a one of your raids you can turn them into what's called a gardening raid and a gardening raid will be uh, planting mines 
in one of one or more of these hexes. If you have two gardening raids, you can select up to two targets here, two hexes. If you have one gardening raid, you got to pick which uh, which hex they're going to lay mines in. Uh, the value in the little mine symbol, like you see in hex M1, L1, K1, those that's how many victory points you get for uh, laying mines in that hex. There's no combat table or anything to roll for success or failure, just getting your raiders into that hex, leaving and going home will uh, impart that many victory points. Uh, there are a number of orbits, uh, radio beacon orbits. Um, I've posted uh, the, the mine counter here at Herzog up in hex I-1. That's actually a radio beacon and when German night fighters are placed on a radio beacon they have the opportunity to perhaps infiltrate a uh, uh, bomber stream or a raid counter uh, if it's in the same or an adjacent hex. So radio beacons you can respond to a uh, if a city is being bombed or or something like that you can uh, respond much quicker if you are on a radio beacon and you have to be deployed onto those. It's not enough just to be in the same hex as a radio beacon you have to actually be deployed on that radio beacon. Let's see uh, each uh, German night fighter squadron has an airbase. Those are indicated on the map by a little airbase symbol in yellow. And then the name of the squadron that's going to be there. That squadron name will then match to one of the counters over in the ready box. So that's where your airfields are. And to help you out with that, if you look at any of the night fighters in the ready box, you'll see that there's a hex uh, notation on them. For example, uh, let's just pull this guy out here. This is this guy has a hex notation M4. So if we look over at X M4, we'll find that this squadron, the one NJG5, belongs to that airbase there. So that's uh, that's how you can track which fighters belong to which bases. It it works pretty well. All right, there's airbases. We covered the beacons. Okay, cities themselves. Uh, some cities are just noted on the map for uh, interest purposes. Uh, Amsterdam, Antwerp, and uh, I think those might be the only two notional ones on this map. There's more of those on the downfall map because the front lines have been um, pressed beyond what they are on this map. Uh, those those cities are, are cities that cannot be bombed. They have no function in the game. They're just there for historic interest. Cities that can be bombed, they have a uh, they're they're noted by a square, and then there's several different. Uh, notations inside that city. So make sure I get this right. I'm going to look these up. On the upper left hand side, let me draw your attention to, let's just look at Berlin here. Right over here is Berlin. Berlin, you'll see that there's a number in the upper left. Okay, that number is the flak value for that city. The, uh, the, the city uh, is in a circle. There's an A within a circle. The circle determines the radar signature. If it's in a circle, then it's got a poor signature. If it's a square, it's normal signature. If it's got a white triangle, then it is a, uh, a good signature. So um, the letter itself indicates which of the submaps. In fact, if you click on the toolbar, you'll see there's a button for city maps. It's two icons to the right of the coffee mug icon. And if you click on that, and if you, you'll see a little pop-up menu, and then you can click on A, B, C, D, and so forth. If you click on the A map, you'll see that that's what Berlin, basically, any, any bombing rate of Berlin would then shift over to this map, and that's where you're going to resolve the actual bombing to find out what actually gets hit in the city, and if any firestorms get started, that sort of thing. So that's what's going on with the cities. Uh, some cities have, like, a little music note. Uh, what that indicates is that there is a... Uh, there is oboe, um, which I believe comes into play through a card. Uh, so a city with the oboe signature, if you have that card in your hand, a card in your hand that can use that feature, uh, that's what that uh, little music note thing is for. So that's the information on the cities. Uh, last thing on the map that we haven't covered is flak symbols. Like you'll see some of these throughout the Ruhr area you have also the Ruhr area has a haze it's like a permanent haze there that will impact uh, uh, visibility and so forth so be aware of that uh, the little flak signature there or the flak symbol that uh, is area flak and so just flying through that hex will cause a bomber uh, or bomber stream to be attacked by that flak 
just uh, flying through a hex that contains a city does not necessarily mean that that city attacks you with the city's flak. For example, here you have Dortmund, uh, which has got a flak value of 3 in that city. See right here? Uh, if you're flying through hex J6, uh, Dortmund does not attack you with its flak. It's just uh, the area flak that will attack you. The only time you're attacked by, by a city's flak is when you're actually bombing that particular city. So I think that's all the symbols we got to cover on the map. Next, let's uh, talk about the weather zones. The, the, uh, the map is divided up into zones, and you can see that there's a bunch of weather markers that are placed out there. Those are counters I've already pre-positioned. Yeah, I, I'm getting to that. Um, there's weather zones on the map. There's six of them, and I've already drawn weather for those uh, those six zones. One is England, and then the other five are the uh, Yag divisions, which are are, are going to be where the different squadrons take off. And those boundaries are noted by dashed lines. So you can see the little orange dashed lines. Those are what divide up the different Yag divisions, and thus the weather zones. Uh, throughout the middle of the map, there's another boundary. And that is uh, these these thick yellow lines. That's the Himmer Belt. And what happens with that is any of the night fighters that are in the Himmer Belt can be uh, assigned ground uh, ground control, and they can do ground control intercept or GCI. And that's a way that a fighter can attack any German plane that that flies through uh, a GCI fighter's uh, hex or an adjacent Himmer Belt hex. Uh, to that uh, GCI equipped fighter. And any time a bomber or bomber stream goes through the Himmer Belt hex, the German player will be notified of that. So whether or not the German player can actually attack it successfully remains to be seen, but uh, the Himmer Belt's real important. I think then that is everything on the map. Okay. So, so well, a short. Uh, a slight correction. The musical notes is for old bombing aid Obol, and that improves bombing accuracy uh, by a factor of minus one, according to the shish. That's what it is. Okay, I was thinking there was a card that, that interacted with that, but to um, be honest with you, I haven't actually bombed a city that's had that, so I have not encountered that yet. But that uh, that would then be on the bombing card, yeah? Yep, there it is on the marking table. Okay, so sorry about that guys, that's my second of ten allowed mistakes. Okay, uh, let's just go ahead and walk through the sequence of play here and we'll just start playing this thing because it, it goes pretty quick. Um, first of all there's two sequences, one is uh, for the setup and I've already done a lot of that so let me just walk you through what I've already done prior to the demo here just to speed things along. Um, setting up play, basically the first thing you do is you obviously you lay the map out, you put the markers out there. Uh, the game turn always begins on one. Uh, jamming marker always begins on five. You'll see there's a little start notation there, so you can see where it's supposed to go. Uh, once you've done that, you get all the fighters put in the ready box. Um, one of the things I haven't done yet is, and i got to zoom in here to do this, draw your attention over to the uh, fighter ready box on the left hand side of your screen. You'll see that there's a number of fighters that have a star on them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to die roll for those. I've got to make a die roll for them. On a one or a two, that, that uh, fighter stays in there. If I roll anything higher than a two, then that fighter squadron is not available for this raid. So, let's start with this one, uh, the third squadron of JG3. We're going to go ahead and roll a die for him. And it's a three, so he goes away. And then we have this one. We roll a die for him. It's a six, so he's not going to join the raid. And we got this guy here. He rolls a three, so a lot of fighters are not available tonight. Last one with a... Oh, wait, there's two more with a star. This guy... Again, not available. This guy, not available. None of the star squadrons are available tonight, so I'll just go ahead and get rid of those. All right, uh, let me cover the, uh, the the fighter information just real quick here. Uh, let's go ahead and pick these two here to look at. I'll draw your attention to the squadron on the left with the ME-110s. At the top, you'll find the uh, the designation, which will match up with an airfield on the map. 
Uh, on the uh, right hand side you have the YAG division that it belongs to. So this particular one, the 4NJG5, it belongs to YAG division 1. So if I zoom my map out here, if you look you'll see that the boundary for YAG division 1 is the area on the upper right hand side of the map which includes the city of Berlin. So that's that's an area that that'll show you which approximate area to look for the airfield if you're you know wanting to uh, just at a glance look at what uh, what squadrons belong to what areas and I think in the vassal module yeah they're arranged in rows so Yag Division ones on top then twos beneath it then threes then uh, fours and sevens okay so uh, that's all the information on top uh, on the um, the middle of the counter off to the left let me zoom in again here. Uh, you'll find the uh, hex ID of the uh, unit's airbase. So again, real easy to uh, find out where their airbase is. You find the aircraft type down the lower left. It is only really important for, um, I think, fuel purposes. Uh, how much fuel that the fighter has. Because if you look at the fuel track, it'll tell you where to put the fuel marker based according to aircraft type. Uh, the number on the lower right hand side is the strength. Obviously the higher the better. And then the two dots on the 4NJG-5, that is uh, telling you it's a two-engine equipped uh, night fighter squadron. And that's important for uh, certain rules because uh, two-engine fighters are able to do tame bore attacks, which are able to infiltrate uh, bomber streams, that sort of thing. I think, I'd have to double check, but I think in the downfall uh, scenario, there's... Uh, some things that the, the single engine fighters can do that they can't do here in the Berlin scenario. Uh, that one and uh, JG301, that uh, is an ME109 squadron. It's, it's fairly weak. They don't have a lot of fuel. They can't stay aloft very long. Basically, those guys are really uh, useful for attacking the bombers when they're actually over the city, but they're not useful for a whole lot else. They can't do night, uh, excuse me, ground control intercept. That's a, a big thing that single engines can't do. It's you need the the two engine planes to do that. So I think that's it for the uh, the fighter information. So setting the game up. Oh, white stripe. Someone asked what the white stripe is for. That means it's on its reduced strength side. Now some of these only have a reduced strength side, and I think with downfall, all of them are reduced strength, which means uh, they can't they don't have a lot of longevity in combat. If they don't have the white stripe, like for example the 4 NJG-5, if I flip him over, you'll see he's white striped and his strength value is reduced. Okay, so setting up, we uh, place the night fighters there and check for any of the ones with stars, so technically I should have done that earlier, but it doesn't make a whole lot of difference here for the demo. Uh, next thing you do is you select a target uh, for tonight. So I've already done that, but what I would do here is I'll pull out some target shit so you can see this. And of course, it's not letting me. That's a problem. Okay, if does anyone have the uh, target? Um, if you have any of the hand windows open, please close them at this time. I think that that might be what's inhibiting me from uh, opening those up. If you have a uh, chits open, target chits, please close those. For some reason, for some reason, it's not letting me open those up, and I think it might be a password conflict. All right, let's see here. Okay, there we go. Now I got the target chits available to me. Okay, uh, what would happen is there's there's two different colored chits. Uh, well, actually three different colored chits. Uh, depending on the scenario, the red and pink ones, those are for downfall. We're not going to use any of those, so I'll throw those away. Uh, the other target chits will be um, for the Berlin scenario, and there's a ton of them. And they'll tell you how many victory points you get. Uh, there's some information regarding uh, Moon uh, for the advanced rules, the seven namely in the blue circle that's for the advanced rules and also to tell you the location of the city the hex grid location our target for night the one I chose um, randomly drew out was uh, Dresden so that's actually our target for tonight ordinarily the uh, German player would not be privy to that information 
So we've already selected the target. Next thing you do is you uh, go ahead and target the, uh, or you check the environment. So I've already done that, but what you do is you pull out the weather chits. So in this case, we would only use the good weather because we're playing with the normal rules, advanced rules. There's a possibility of bad weather. So we've already drawn those, and you just draw one to each uh, weather zone on the map. For example, England got clear, and uh, once you have the weather established, uh, then you uh, got to check the visibility, and I've already done that. There is a little table, and I don't know why they didn't put the table right next to the uh, track on the map, but there's a little table in the rule book. Uh, if you roll a 1, it's good weather, a 6, it's bad weather, and anything in between means it's just moderate weather. So right now we're in moderate weather, and there's never any moon in the uh, uh, basic game scenarios. So we've established that. Next thing you would do is you would get your, uh, your raid plotted, and I've already done that. If you haven't already, here is, I'm putting into the uh, chat bar on Vassal a link to the planning map. If you're watching by video, I'm just going to shift my screen over here so you can see the uh, Bomber Command uh, planning sheet that I've done. If you're looking at those, you'll see that I have uh, four different raids planned. During, during the uh, Berlin scenario, you have one main force, and then you have three Mosquito raids. Of the three mosquito raids, up to two of them may be converted into a gardening raid. Now, a gardening raid is not a mosquito raid, meaning the planes in the gardening raid are not mosquitoes. They are vulnerable, uh, much more vulnerable than mosquitoes to uh, night fighter attacks. I believe fighter attacks. I'm getting an open mic from somebody. The uh, gardening raids, I believe, historically were Wellingtons during this period. So. On this map here, uh, Raid B, is in Bravo, is a gardening raid and is going to target Hex M1. The main raid is A, and it's going to target Dresden. Uh, raid C is going to break off of main raid A at Hex L3, and it's going to bomb Berlin. And then uh, Raid D is going to target Kassel, and is actually going to be heading from another direction in order to try to confuse the German player. So ordinarily, obviously, the German player would not be privy to this information. This is all drawn up in advance, and this, this is going to track the movement of the bombers. Once this is done, the bomber's movement is fixed to whatever is plotted. It's not going to deviate from this. Uh, there's a couple rules you need to know about this. You can have uh, up to four legs on your trip out to the target. So exam for example, Raid A has one leg from hex uh, D4 to I2, and then its second leg is from I2 to the target at P5, and then uh, it can have a, up to four additional legs on the return trip. Now, uh, Raid C actually does this. Raid C has uh, a leg from uh, D4 to I2, and then from I2 to L3, and then L3 to M3, M3 to O4 Berlin. That's four. That's the maximum I can do with that particular raid. Now, mosquitoes can escort the raid um, and then break away from it as I've done here. But once they've broken away, you can't have two different raids in the same hex. So I did make a mistake. If you download the JPEG from the, uh, from the link provided on GMT's site earlier today, I had a mistake where um, raid uh, D, as in Delta, was coming back in the same hexes as raid C. I didn't catch that until uh, just before the demo, so I have corrected it if you use that link that I posted earlier. Uh, basically, it's going to start breaking southwest in hex H5. So that's probably the most uh, important information in the... Uh, that, the, that the, the British player is going to do early on. The biggest decisions they're making uh, involve the raids. Now, in the downfall scenario, the British player gets to have two main force raids, five mosquito raids, and one decoy raid. Uh, since we're doing the Berlin scenario, we're not using any decoy raid here. Okay, last but not least, if you have opened up the uh, British cards and hand window, I need you to close that. Please close that window at this time so I can access it. Close any card. If you have any window open on your screen with cards in it, please close that window so I can access both of those. 
what will happen next is I have to get into those windows. Um, the players would then draw eight cards. I've already done that. And uh, of those eight cards, uh, five of them are selected as the opening hand. The remainder are put back into the deck, and the deck is reshuffled. All right, I have access to the British hand. I need access to the German hand. If you have the window open on your screen somewhere that's got the... Uh, the German cards in it. I need you to close that for me, please. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to. I was hoping that this would allow us to all have these these cards open at the same time, but uh, alas, it is not to be. So lesson for next time. I'll try to make a next time I do a demo like this I'll make a modification to the module so that everybody can watch this stuff uh, without having a con conflict with the hand windows. Okay, these are the cards from the uh, British player hand. I need whoever has the German player hand open to please close that window. Click the little X on the left because I still can't access that one. Uh, let me talk about the cards real quick. The cards, the card play in the game is very open-ended, and you can basically play cards in any phase of the game except for the, the setup and the card draw phase. It's the only times you can't play a card, but any other time, uh, even if it's not your turn to do something per se, you can actually play a card then. Uh, the cards are divided up into suits, if you will. Uh, each of the suits, there's four suits, has a little symbol. Like this one here has a little electronic symbol in the upper right. Uh, this one here has a little airplane symbol uh, for aircraft equipment. This is electronic equipment. And then you have this one here, which is for operations. It's got a little flag on it. And then there's another symbol that's got uh, a bomb symbol, which is a card that's going to help you out with bombing. If you play a card, your opponent can actually cancel your card by playing two cards of his own that have the same suit. For example, if I were to play the Mandrell card as the British player, my opponent could actually uh, play two cards with the electronic symbol in order to cancel my card play. So that's the important information for the suits. Okay, good. I've got the German window here. So here's the German cards. Let me throw these out there. And here's one, here's a German card that's got the little bomb symbol on it. Now, you can have a maximum of five cards in your hand. Uh, you can end up with fewer than that in your hand. And uh, what we have to do at this point is both players would look at their hand and they would just, they would pick some cards uh, that they want to have in their opening hand. And obviously early in the game, bombing cards, bombing suit cards, like, spread these out a little bit here. Bombing cards like this one, smoke pots, that wouldn't be useful early on. So what I'd do is I would discard smoke pots as the Germans. And then anything that increases detection, I would want to have that early. So or, or that reduces the jamming level. So I would hang on to those two for sure. Um, the abbreviation TE on this card here, the SN-2B. TE stands for twin engine bomber. SE stands for single engine. Uh, fighter, excuse me. Uh, this might be a useful card. Um, tell you what, this one here is not terribly uh, useful early on, so let's go with uh, Stragglers, Himmel, but yeah, one's not useful early on. So let's go with these for the uh, for the German player hand. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to put the German hand there, and I'll put these other ones back in the, the German deck. So I'm going to keep these cards out on the map so that we can see what's going on with these. Uh, for the British side, anything uh, that improves... I should go in the discard pile. No, it says that the, the deck is reconstituted at this point. My mistake. Yeah, I, I, I was doing it that way, and then when I was um, playing with somebody else, uh, I discovered I had been doing that incorrectly, that when you're doing the setup here, you actually do reconstitute the deck. So anything you discard here in the opening, you eventually have the possibility of redrawing. Okay, uh, for these guys here, uh, Mandrell is useful early on, and Accident is useful early. Uh, Serret... 
fuel famine. I'm not going to take the time to read through all of these. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, flour is useful early on for sure. And fish pond might be useful in this one. I'm, I'm going to put those in there and the rest of these I'm going to put back into the British draw pile. All right, so we're going to put our um, our British player hand way up here on the upper part of the screen. So there's our cards. Now we're ready to roll. So let's go through the play sequence. It's real easy. The first phase of play mm -hmm. is the first uh, phase of play is draw cards. You're going to skip this on the first turn. Uh, any other turn, what you'll do is you can um, you can discard any number of cards from your hand. And then you can draw up to three cards, but you can't go over five cards in your hand. So here we are, turn one. Uh, we skipped the draw cards phase, and now the fighters can move. Now at this point, because the German player has no idea where any of these bombers are, um, he doesn't have any fighters up in the air, so he's not going to move anybody. But if he did, single engine and twin engine fighters can move up to two hexes. Twin engine fighters uh, with a scramble marker on it can move up to one hex and then the scramble marker can then be removed from it. Um, units that don't have GCI markers, uh, they can uh, actually, well actually they're going to have that place a little bit later, but uh, you, you also have to remember that to reduce the fuel for any of the fighters that are up in the air that are not marked with GCI, you have to reduce their fuel on the fuel track. Well, we don't have any of that uh, going on right now, and also um, it doesn't make any sense to scramble, which is the next thing you do, is scramble fighters. Whenever you scramble fighters, you also have to roll on a table, which is not, I believe, included in Vassal. But uh, you roll on a table, and as long as there's good weather in the, the region where the fighter squadron is based, it's not going to be a problem. But if you do have um, you know fighters based there, uh, in, in where there's bad weather or fog, you can actually lose a lot of fighters that way. So you have to you have to be aware of the weather before you scramble fighters. All right, next thing that happens is raids move. Well, there's nothing to move on the map, and the raid counters don't move on the map. Uh, you have to look at your planning map, and then what you do is, um, f well, first of all, whenever the raids move, you remove any of the raid or bomber stream counters from the map. If they were placed earlier, you would actually remove them. And then you would inform the, the uh, British player, or excuse me, the German player, would be informed if any of the, f the bombers are now entering a city that they're going to bomb, or if they're entering a GCI hex, which are those yellow Himmer, Himmer belt, uh, Himmel belt uh, hexes, or if they're entering uh, a hex that's got flak, they would have to notify the German player of that. And then combat would then be resolved. Even though there's no raid counters or bomber stream counters on the map, you would actually resolve counter then. And you would do that in a specific order. I believe it's flak first. Um, was it flak, GCI, then um, wild boar attacks? Something like that. I'll, we'll, we'll get to it in a moment. Right now, none of that's going to happen. In fact, it might be the other way around. It might be GCI, then flak. No, I think it's flak first, then GCI, then wild boar. Uh, there's basically four different types of combat. You're going to have flak attacks, you're going to have uh, GCI, which is when you have a GCI marked aircraft in a Himmer belt um, making an attack, and then you have what's called wild boar, which are the, uh, the night fighters that are attacking a uh, bomber group that's bombing a city. Uh, tame boar is the fourth kind of combat. It's not done at this time, it's done after infiltration uh, takes place, and it's a little bit later in the sequence of play. Okay, Roger, Roger's correct. It's GCI, then Flak, then Wild Boar. And he's right. It's marked on the markers, which is why I don't have it um, uh, open on, in front of me right now. Okay, so the raids move, but nothing actually moves on the map right now. It just, the, uh, the, the British player is going to look at his planning sheet, and he's going to inform the German player of what the German player needs to know. Uh, next thing we do is raid detection. So here what we do is we roll to detect raids, but... Hang on, we got some cards to play. Now, who gets to play a card first? Well, it's open-ended. Whoever wants to play a card first gets to play first. Um, if players just get into a, like a what do you call Mexican standoff with their cards, I guess you could have like a, a you know a house rule where you count down from three 
three, two, one, and then if nobody says something by then, then you move on from there. In this case here, let's just say that German player throws out Naxberg first. The effect is to reduce the jamming level by one. Now the jamming level, if you look at the jamming track, the jamming level, uh, it determines how successful uh, a detection roll will be. Because what's going to happen is you're going to roll two dice, two d6s, and you really want to roll greater than the jamming level number. Uh, the infiltration number is something different. That's for when you want a twin engine uh, night fighter to infiltrate a bomber stream. So what we got here is Naxberg is going to reduce the jamming level by one. But before you actually do that, the German player, if he's got two cards with that little electronic symbol on it, uh, he could actually play those two and cancel the card play. Well, turns out that the uh, British player does not have it. They only have one with the electronic symbol, so they can't cancel it. So the jamming level is then reduced from the four down to the five, and this card would then be discarded. And once it's discarded, it's gone from the game. Uh, decks are not going to be reconstituted during course of play. You're going to go through a deck, uh, through the better part of a deck once. Okay, so uh, they played that. Um, British player uh, declines to play anything to impact any of this stuff. So next thing that's going to happen is we're going to make a die roll for raid detection. But before we roll the die, a German player says, hold on. I'm going to modify that detection roll by plus two. And then the, uh, the, the German player can say, well, wait a second. I've got Mandrell. I'm going to subtract two from a single die roll uh, if it's in game turns one or two. So basically, these two, the effect of these two cards is to cancel each other out. So we're going to make a straight up die roll. All right, the die roll is a seven. So then we consult the uh, detection table, which is unfortunately not in the module, but uh, if you roll less than the jamming level, nothing's detected. If you roll equal to the jamming level, you detect uh, raids that have been infiltrated by night fighters, uh, main force, main force, excuse me, and decoy raids. If the Naxos marker is on the jamming track, and Naxos is brought into play by an event card, so none of that is true. Um, if the roll is one greater than the jamming level, all raids are detected. You place raid counters in the map. In addition, if the Naxos is on, then uh, the air picture is actually clarified and you get to place the bomber stream counters on the map. Last thing is if uh, the die roll is two or more greater than the jamming level, then uh, the, the ra all the raids are detected and the air picture is clarified with um, the player being able to see the uh, bomber stream counters. So here we have it. Uh, the roll was a seven. It is two greater than the jamming level of four. So... Um, we have all raids detected. So looking over at the log sheet, we see that in turn one, raid A is in box one. So just for grins, we'll go ahead and do this. Put raid A in box, what was it? Excuse me, raid A is in uh, hex E4. So that's where he's gonna start. And you do not have to show the direction the raid is traveling, by the way. You can place the counter any way you want. Uh, but since the air picture was clarified, and this is a main raid, we do have to place the stream counters, which trail two hexes behind, which in essence shows you the direction that a main force raid is traveling. So uh, that's the advantage to having a clarified air picture. Uh, raid Bravo is in hex E. Five. That's going to be our gardening raid. Of course, the German player doesn't know that. And then uh, raids Charlie and Delta are not on the game map at this time. So that's what the German player would then see. The German player could then use markers. Um, trying to find them here in the module. Oh, there they are. You can use markers, these track markers, to mark these things, kind of like how you do a night fighter, because on the next turn, all these raid and trail uh, markers are going to go away. So you can use these track markers to try to track uh, the air picture. So you can kind of get an idea of where you think the bombers are heading so you can scramble fighters accordingly. Everybody with me so far? Control. Control. Yeah. Can I interrupt and just add one little thing right here? Yeah, go ahead. Actually, in the situation that you have right here, German player wouldn't know what direction 
that the uh, that the trail the bomber stream was going, because it could theoretically, because in this game the bomber stream could be, let me zoom in just a little bit here, uh, the bomber stream could be from E5 to D4 to C5, or it could be E4 D4 C5. So the German play, if you put the two raids in E4 and E5 first, and then put the stream behind, the German player doesn't know if it's coming straight across the board or if it's going up. Yeah, that that's a good. That's actually a very good point. Um, you're right because these two raids are adjacent to one another. Uh, whenever you're traveling, if you're traveling directly to the east, then it could be that E5 is the main raid traveling eastward. Or it could be that the main raid is E4 traveling northeastern. So yeah, that's a good point. You, it's easy to forget that if a raid is traveling, like say, like this, this this is another possibility here. If the if the main force was traveling directly east, you know, you have the uh, alternating hex grid there. So yeah, good point there, Mike. And it can get really confusing. The, the goal of the British player in planning is to try to confuse the Germans as much as possible. And from what I've seen, it's not that hard to do. <laughs> There's no stream information for rig B. I'm sorry, say again? There's no stream information for rig B. No, uh, gardening raids and mosquito raids do not trail a stream behind them because these are smaller uh, groups of bombers. Only the main force raids actually trail streams, and I think decoys. Correct, decoys have a stream also. And that's what, I, I can't wait to play Downfall because Downfall, you have two main forces and one decoy. I'll bet that's a real, uh, a real mess to try to decipher as the German player. You could also turn in um, two mosquito raids in Berlin for one decoy. Yeah, I uh, I did not do that in this particular in this particular case. I wanted the extra mossies and and the gardening raid. But yeah, good point there. You can do that. You can you can trade. You have three mossy raids. You can trade on a one for one basis for gardening. Up to two of the mossies can be gardening, or you can trade in two of your uh, mossy raids for a decoy. All right. So that's the detection picture. Uh, at this point, then you go to deployment, which means that the the players, if they have any airborne night fighters that are not marked with scramble or anything like that, they can be deployed on any beacon or city in their hex. So let's just imagine for a moment that this fighter was in this hex and he was airborne. He could deploy onto that uh, beacon, which then puts him into a position to better uh, attack uh, bombers if they're in an in or an adjacent hex. It's always good if you're on one of those beacons, if any action happens in that hex or an adjacent hex, you have a better chance of attacking it successfully. Same thing can also be said of uh, orbiting over cities, especially if you manage to be you have fighters over the target city, then your wild boar attacks against the bombers are going to be pretty lethal. Okay, so that was one turn, and then you would do recovery. Um, if you have any planes that are landing, that sort of thing, you have to recover, you have to roll the dice to see if they land safely. Anyone that's played the Night Fighter campaign knows that uh, Night Fighters almost never land safely. And then uh, you do the bombing. Uh, whenever there's you know, a city's actually being bombed, you would take care of that then. And then you have the end for the end phase. So this, this whole thing here um, moves along really quickly early on. Joe. Sure. Uh, a short uh, play uh, observation. Uh, I found when I tried it out that manning the uh, Himmelbett hexes with GCI fighters is a good way of having a sort of a, establish a tripwire if you don't have detection. Yeah, that's correct. I I usually sit out the first turn uh, and not scramble on the first turn. Um, just hoping that I'll get a, a good detection roll, especially if I've got cards in my hand. I think it's going to decrease the uh, the jamming and give me a good detection. That way, I can I can make a 
a good focus scramble on turn two to uh, deal with what I think may be uh, coming at me. But yeah, definitely, the, the Himmerbelt hexes are great tripwire. They're going to give you information whether or not your detection is detecting anything that turn. Uh, whenever bombers go through those, those belts, they are going to give the German player some info and possibly attack opportunities. Another thing you're going to keep in mind too is when you scramble twin engine fighters, the gate turn that you scramble them, they're on their airfield and they don't get to move until the next turn and then only one hex. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it, it could be too late for the forward squadrons, but uh, not for the, the ones that are um, a little bit further back. Okay, so let's go on to turn two. Um, draw cards phase. Now, if you have, you know, only one card in your hand, obviously you're not going to want to discard anything. You would just draw your three cards. Remember, you can only draw three cards, but never have more than five cards in your hand. So in this case here, just to keep things simple and to keep things moving along, I'm just going to go ahead and draw two for the Germans. Whoops, excuse me, the British are only going to draw one bad looking at the wrong part of my screen okay so they're gonna draw one and then got the German board here Hang on a second here make sure I put those in the right spot okay and then the, the Germans they're just gonna draw two so there they go all right so cards have been drawn and then we go on to fighters move so here's where I'm gonna go ahead and uh, scramble some stuff here. So let's go ahead and take and scramble a whole bunch of things along the hammer belt. Since it looks like a lot of people are disapproving of my tactic. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and pop the guys in three and Yag Division two. So let me zoom in a little bit here. Sorry if I'm bouncing the screen around with the video. Okay, we're rolling again here. Um, we're going to go ahead and launch a bunch of fighters here from zones uh, 2 and 3. So let's go ahead and take... I'm going to leave my single engine planes alone for now, but let's go ahead and take these guys up in the air in 3. So I think they have a right-click function that sends them to their base. or to their airfield. Let's see, what is it? Scramble? It's Control H, that's what it is. Alright, so we sent a bunch of these over to their home base and now we're going to uh, mark them with a scramble marker. Alright, so they're getting up in the air, and then we'll get the guys down here. Probably should uh, scramble the guys in the south there too. Yeah, so let's launch some guys from four and see which ones do I want. Again, the single engine planes are uh, very limited on their fuel, so you want to be careful with them. Just three squadrons in four, and we'll launch them as a precaution. So there you go. Um, now we got to make a whole bunch of die rolls. I'll tell you what, looking at the table, I think some of these are going to be automatically safe just because of the good weather. On the scramble table, you basically you're going to roll two dice and you're going to look at the column that pertains to the weather that uh, is in the area where the planes are taking off. So we'll start from north to south. Up there in zone uh, three, zone two, excuse me, we have broken cloud, which is the first column, only a 12 is going to 
do anything. Yeah, only a 12 is going to do anything. So uh, minus 1 if the weather is good. So even a 12 is not going to do anything. So basically all these guys are going to be safe pending any card play by the German or by the British. Now the British have a card that says accident. Add 2 to any single scramble or recover roll. Treat results of 0 on the scramble or recovery tables as 1. So let's say they play that. Now over on the uh, German side, if they play two cards that have the little flag symbol on it, they could cancel it, but they don't. So, which one would they play it on? Well, it would be on the, the squadron right before it would roll. So, in this case, the Jutland squadron they're not as, as scared of. So, let's just say this one here. Go ahead, this one, and it scrambles safely. So, we're going to put its fuel marker on the fuel track. Whoops, looks like I sent the whole plane there. Hang on. There we go. Okay, next one down is also going to place its fuel. And this would be the one um, that I would probably play that card on because it's a three-string squadron. And what will what it'll do is the result of the result on the table, in this case, because of the card play. Uh, the play of the card flower, it's going to basically make uh, make any die roll result a one loss. So the result is the number of night fighter casualties lost to accidents. If there is a D next to the number, which there isn't, uh, then the fighter would be depleted and flipped over to its reduced strength side. So in this case here, well, I guess it didn't really matter which one we used, uh, but we're going to go ahead and place a uh, loss marker down. So that shows that there has already been one fighter loss for the Germans due to an accident. Excuse me, I didn't mean to play flower, but accident. Okay, and we've gotten two uh, fuel symbols up there. Next one, we also have flower. Play this one, any night fighter unit in two or three or four scrambles. Do not roll for scramble losses. Instead, move it to the closed airfield box. Uh, cannot be played on night fighters scrambling in fog or heavy cloud. Basically, it takes this out of play. So that would be a good one to play on this squadron in J3. So he ends up over in the closed airfield box. He can come back into play, but um, he won't be able to do anything uh, until he's uh, been refueled and all that stuff. He's got to go through the whole refuel process. So... Just making sure I have the right fuel markers out there. Looks like I have the wrong one on there, so let me make a fuel marker for this guy. There we go. Just delete that guy. So there you get an idea of, of card play in there. And the card play is really what makes the game uh, interesting, I think, for the British player, because once the raid starts, there's not a lot of decision making for him until he actually gets to the target for, uh, that the main force is bombing. Joe on a tip. Uh, you can create fuel markers with, for fighters by right clicking on them and also sending to them then to the fuel track that way. Yes, I, I know you can do that. That's how I'm creating them. But sending them to the fuel track, I think, sends them to the zero. So um, since I had the screen open and could see the uh, actual numbers, that's why I did it that way on those. And I'm fixing here to make a whole bunch of them at once here in the south. There we go. And that's actually faster um, than in the physical game. <laughs> and again, because the um, because the weather's good, I'm not going to mess around with rolling uh, for stuff here. But 
if you're playing the advanced game and you have poor weather, this is a real it's a real tough decision of whether you want to scramble stuff in certain areas just because you stand a chance of losing fighters and any fighters that get up they're depleted, which means they're probably not going to stay up for a whole long time and they're not going to be as useful as they would otherwise would be. But it, it does make for some very interesting decisions when you have some rough weather to deal with. Okay, so we've scrambled all the fighters. Next thing we do, the raids would then move. So all of this data here would go away. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up a combat situation, a couple of them. Check that. I'm going to leave the, the raid counters where they are for now. Uh, let's just assume for a second that this uh, this fighter squadron here has been up for a while. Let's say he's up on uh, on an orbit. And let's go ahead and put this guy here and we'll mark him with GCI. Let's say these guys have been up for a while. Uh, what would happen is during the raid's move phase, let's say that we have... Um, let me look at my uh, planning sheet for a second here. J2, I think something's going to happen in J2. Okay, so let's let's skip forward a little bit and just say that in, in hex J2, uh, we know that uh, the main force raid is going to come hopping through there on turn four. They're going to pass through J2 and into K3. Uh, when that happens, what would what we would do is we would place. Uh, combat markers down for the benefit of the German player. We would place a GCI marker there indicating that bombers have flown into that hex. Uh, if there was area flak in J2 we would place a flak combat and again you can see the order of combat is on the counter. Uh, we discussed that a little bit earlier. But there is no flak there so we're not going to use that. Uh, and if they were bombing anything in that hex then there would be a third uh, combat marker which would be wild boar. So, for example, if they were bombing uh, Bremer Heaven in Hex J3, you could conceivably have all three markers then placed in that hex. In this case, let's just say it's uh, GCI uh, combat only. What will happen is we will look at a combat table, and this is real easy to do. The combat table, you're going to roll two dice, and you look at the column that pertains to the type of attack. Uh, GCI, tame boar, wild boar, that sort of thing. You look at the column pertaining to that. In this case, we would use GCI, column, which is the leftmost column, and we roll two dice and then we would modify it. And again, card play can interact with all this. So if you have a card that, uh, let's see, we use flower. Uh, if you have a card that actually uh, impacts this, you can play that. Now, in Hex J2, it's a main force raid, so fish pond. For the British player, the fish pond card could be played, as well as uh, looks like rear gunner could be played. Some of these cards, it says specifically, cannot be used on a mosquito raid. And remember that gardening raids are not mosquito raids. So here, first of all, before we roll, the German player is probably going to want to uh, play something here. Um, he can play this card to increase a die roll. And... He's got actually two of those. He could actually play both those cards on the on this thing, but he's going to leave it alone. He's just going to play the one. And again, the, the British player could try to cancel it, but he doesn't have the right cards here. And instead what happens is the German player uh, decides to um, play Fish Pond. And the effect is Fish Pond subtracts one from a single night fighter attack roll may not be played on mosquito raids. Okay, so he's going to subtract one, but then the SN-2B is going to add three. And again, it has to be a twin-engine fighter, but the guy in J3 is a twin-engine fighter. And because he's marked with GCI combat, uh, a GCI intercept, the night fighter in hex J3 can uh, participate in night fighter combats in his own hex, or in hexes J2 or I4, which are Himmerbelt hexes, that have a GCI combat marker in it. But they can only participate in one of those. So if there's multiple uh, bombers penetrating through his sector, uh, he could he would have to pick which one he was going to attack. And again, he wouldn't know which one's a mosquito raid and which one's a main force raid. Of course, in this case, since the British player played Fish Pond, then he would know that it's either a gardening raid that's coming through here or a main force raid that's coming through J2. 
So we roll two dice. Once all the cards are played, we roll two dice and we modify them. And it's a seven. Uh, we add the strength of the Night Fighter, which is a three. So the seven is up to a ten. Uh, it's up plus two because of the net difference on the card, so it's up to twelve. Uh, it is not, if it was a decoy raid, there would be plus two, plus one, excuse me. There's also a visibility modifier that could apply. In this case, our visibility is normal, so there's nothing happening there. Uh, and then there's, there's other modifiers that could apply in different types of attacks, not this one. So the seven basically becomes eight, nine, and then ten. Looking at the ten row, we find that we inflict one loss and we inflict one uh, disrupt on the target. So we'll go over here to the little boxes, the raid boxes, and that's where we're going to put uh, the losses in here. First of all, A, the raid is... I think you were 12, Joe. Was it a 12, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12? You're right, I forgot to add in the, the fighter strikes. Yeah. I forgot to add in the, the fighter strength is what I did. So 12 is a 2D. So it, there's two hits on the bomber. So the bomber losses are tracked up here. Bomber losses are two. And then there is going to be a uh, disruption. And I'm trying to find the counters for that. There we go. Okay. It might be on your player, your player chart in the British. We're going to go ahead and add the disrupt value of 1 for now. And this will go up relentlessly throughout the raid. It also will go up by 1 for every time that the bomber force um, makes a leg change. So whenever you hit a waypoint and the raid changes directions, uh, you're going to add disrupts to it. And the problem that you're going to have is with a main force. If you take a direct route to a target, you, you make it kind of obvious maybe and more vulnerable to night fighters attacking you. But if you take a real zigzag course and use your maximum of four legs, you're going to put four disrupts on before you bomb the target. And that could impact your accuracy big time. So that's basically how GCI combat works, and that's pretty much how the other kinds of combat work, is you just roll two dice, you look at the right column, it tells you how many bombers got shot down, um, if there's going to be disruption added to it, and you just mark that on the, the raid boxes, and there's an additional advanced rule that you can use for more fog of war, where this would actually be tracked on a, uh, on a player aid that he would print out and he so he would write this stuff down on a tablet and the the German player would not have access to it so he really would be in the dark <laughs> literally as to what he's doing to the different raids and the more bombers you shoot down the more points you get at the end of the game alright let's try a tame boar attack um, wild boar attacks would work just like GCI except it be in the hex where bombing is taking place a tame boar is when after you've done a detection roll, let's say we did a detection roll and this was the result. We had a clarified picture of the main raid and the main raid would be going through like so. Let me clear the movement trails here and get rid of these cards. Okay. Um, oh, one other thing about combat. In the last combat, if you roll doubles on your combat roll, then the night fighter is depleted and flipped over. And if he was already flipped over, then he must return to base. He has to get a return to base uh, counter on him. If either of the die rolls is a six, the British player gets to roll a defensive fire attack, which might uh, uh, inflict uh, losses on the uh, night fighters. So it's not always a one-way deal. Okay, here is how a team boar attack would work. Let's let's pretend for a moment that uh, this night fighter, the second of NJG3, is on the uh, radio beacon in hex J3. All right, that's the situation we have right now. And I'm trying to figure out why the movement trails aren't going away. Anyways, uh, what would happen is after you've made the detection roll, you then have the opportunity to uh, do tame bore activities. Any twin engine fighter that's in the same hex as a detected raid or bomber stream counter, or in the same hex as a bombing marker, so in other words, if they're bombing a, a city and a bombing marker has been placed there, indicating that that city is being bombed, you can try to intercept or inter, uh, 
uh, infiltrate the bomber stream. Uh, or if you're stacked on a beacon in an adjacent hex uh, to a, a detected raid or bomber stream counter, you can try to infiltrate. So here's how this would work. With this guy here, i got to make a die roll, and I have to look at the, uh, the infiltrate line on the jamming track. So right now the jamming counter here is on the 4 slash 6 line. Uh, the, the number for infiltration is a 6. So the, the table for this is real simple. You roll two dice and you compare it to the infiltration value on the jamming track. So I can modify this by card play. Let me zoom in so I can read my cards a little bit better. Uh, I think one of these might have been an intercept card or infiltrate card. Nope, some of these cards that the German player has will give them a modifier to this die roll, but I don't see one here. So uh, there's not going to be any modifier for that. Um, Flensburg card. Use the Flensburg card. Oh, there it is. I thought I saw one earlier. Okay, yep, there he is. Yep, Flensburg. Okay, so he would play this. You have to play the card before you roll dice. You can't play it retroactively. So that's going to be a, a plus. Uh, increase a single detection roll by plus one or infiltration roll by plus two. So we're going to do this for the infiltration roll. And if there's certain uh, markers on the jamming track, they'll give you modifiers. Also, the weather modifier for that hex. So if we look over where we're intercepting, uh, and basically if you're in two, if the the bomber stream was straddling two different zones, uh, then the the bombing player would get to pick which weather zone to choose. So here for broken cl broken cloud in hex uh, in uh, zone two, the second Yag division zone, it's broken cloud. So there's going to be a minus one modifier. So now the net modifier is plus one. Uh, if the infiltrating unit is not stacked on a beacon, then there's a minus two. Uh, so that's that's kind of an important detail there. But since he's on a beacon, he'll be able to do this. And then there's some other modifiers that can apply for advanced rules if you're if you're doing uh, rules for wind and that sort of thing. So here it's just a net plus one. Two dice come in. It is a uh, modified four, and so in that res that result is going to be less than the um, infiltration number. If the roll is less than, it does not infiltrate. If the roll is equal to the infiltration value, he infiltrates, but he's depleted if he's not already depleted. And if it's greater than, then he infiltrates and is not depleted. Well, let's just pretend like it was greater than. Okay, when that happens, then we take him off the hex in I-5 and we put the night fighter in the raid box that correlates with the raid that he infiltrated. And then, after he's put there, then any of the, the night fighters that are in raid boxes may then conduct tame bore attacks. Tame bore attacks are a little bit less effective to a degree, I'd say, than, than uh, GCI is. But with the right modifiers, they can produce more casualties. It's just you have to roll higher, a little bit higher than GCI combat. But if you roll really high on there, like a modified 14 or more, it will inflict three losses. So it can be really nasty. So once that's done, you can uh, go ahead and make attack. So before we attack, you know, he can go ahead and use this guy. Um, I think the British player will wait and see what happens with the attack before they try rear gunner. So it's going to be a plus three for his strength, plus three more for the uh, uh, the, the play of the card. Uh, the visibility modifier is nothing. I think that's it. So it's going to be plus six to the roll. Again, we use the same table, but we're going to use the team bore column. So six and four is ten. It is a one D. So one more bomber loss and another uh, disrupt. So his disrupt value is up to two now. And then, um, since neither of the die, the die rolls weren't doubles, so there, you know, there's no di um, disruption, of the, or depletion, I should say, of the night fighter, so he doesn't flip over. Neither of the dice rolls were sixes, so there's no return fire from the, uh, or defensive fire. But the British player has rear gunner which means he can add three to a single bomber defensive fire roll or roll bomber defensive fire after a night fighter attack that rolled no sixes. So he's going to go ahead and play that and he basically rolls two dice and that's not going to do much of anything. So basically 
uh, nothing will happen there. There's a special table for defensive fire. Uh, basically, you have to roll an 8 through 11 to inflict one night fighter loss. A 12 or more will inflict two night fighter losses. So that was a shame there. And remember, losses to night fighters don't necessarily flip the counter over, the, the squadron counter. The squadron counter only flips over on a depletion result, which means low on ammo or low on fuel. Again, fuel is tracked up on the fuel track, but in combat, depletion, you know, if you were uh, severely depleted on there, it could mean that you used up more fuel and now you have to go back to base. Um, if you're ever forced out of a uh, raid box, for example, this infiltrator here, if he's forced out, the British player may place him in any one of the hexes uh, that that raid uh, belongs to. So with a, a raid that's trailing a stream, he can put the night fighter in any one of those hexes that he desires. Obviously, if it's a gardening or a mosquito raid, he has to go back into the same hex as the raid counter. And if you infiltrate a mosquito raid, you must, uh, you, you cannot remain infiltrating. The, the mosquitoes are too fast, and so you only get one attack, and then you're immediately placed back into the hex. With mis it's probably important to, to say at this point that um, when you infiltrate one of these bomber streams, you stay with it. That's why it's placed in those raid boxes that the fighter will stay with that bomber stream as it flies around the map. So as long as you can keep detecting it, um, you can keep attacking it. But if you lose it, you might be somewhere completely in a different area of the map where you, you have to leave. That uh, that bomber. Yeah, and you might have to. Um, you might be forced to land at at, at a different air base, which is going to you know pretty much end that that guy's action for the night. Uh, if you infiltrate a mosquito raid again, uh, you have to. You can't stay with the raid. You have to. You get one attack, and then you have to go back onto the hex grid. If uh, you inflict losses to mosquitoes at the end of the raid. Um, you have to make die roll, die rolls for those losses that you inflicted on mosquitoes, and basically you have a one in six chance that the losses you recorded are actual losses. So mosquitoes are really tough to actually inflict losses on, but they're worth a lot of victory points. So you know it's worth still going after them, but it's just harder to really put the hurt on them. In the downfall scenario, there are mosquito hunters. You can you can uh, make it mosquito hunter attacks with certain types of aircraft, like the ME-262. And when you make those kinds of attacks, then there's only a 1 in 6 chance that a recorded mosquito attack was not uh, an actual kill. Uh, one last thing. Uh, tame boar attacks, um, again, they, they take place in the uh, tame boar phase of the sequence of play. They don't take place during the, the raid movement, uh, like uh, flat combat and wild boar and GCI. Wild boar attacks are just like this, except you're using a different column. And with a wild boar, what happens is when you're bombing a target, let's move the bomber stream over here by Dre to Dresden, because we're going to bomb Dresden here in a minute. Uh, when you uh, when you're doing the raid movement phase before you you know do detection and everything, what would happen is if you're bombing Dresden, what we would do is we would put a bomb drop marker on the city to show them we're, hey we're bombing this city. We would put a flak combat marker there because we're bombing a city that does have a flak value. It's zero, but you know it's there's still a column for that. Uh, then we would put a wild boar. Uh, marker there showing that any any uh, wild boar qualified uh, fighters could then attack it. For wild boar, let me do this. If you have uh, fighters that are in the same city, uh, that are orbiting the city that's being bombed, they're going to get uh, what they call wild boar stacked status, which means they can inflict a lot of damage on the bombers. If you are in the same hex or on a beacon adjacent to the hex being bombed, then you can qualify for uh, wild boar late, which means you're going to use the same column as tame boar attacks. It's not as effective, but you're still going to do something to it. 
So if you had, let's say, this fighter here orbiting this uh, radio beacon, uh, he could actually join it. But he would be wild boar late. And if this guy was orbiting Dresden, he would be wild boar stacked. Uh, any ha any uh, fighters that were not in a beacon in the city, being the, the city hex being bombed, would also be wild boar late. So let's say this guy here was in this hex, but not orbiting the city. Okay, this guy's orbiting the city. Okay. This guy's not, but he's in the hex. This guy's on the beacon. Here's how it would work. This guy is wild boar uh, stacked, and these two guys would be wild boar late. That's how the wild boar attacks would go down. So basically, you roll for flak, and with flak attacks, it's real easy. You roll two dice. You add the strength of the, the flak. In this case, it's a zero, so it's just a straight-up roll. Uh, it's modified by weather in the area, which is zero. Uh, visibility, zero. Minus one to city flak attack if wild boar combat markers are present. So if, there's, if you're doing wild boar attacks there, uh, it's going to be, you know, kind of mess up your flak a little bit. So the seven here would actually become a six. And on the flak columns, basically there would be no losses to flak, but there would be one flak damage counter placed. And what that does, let me put that in the marker box here, that you put it in the raid box, Okay, flak damage. What that is, is whenever you make an attack, you can choose to remove one of these flak damage counters from the raid box of the raid that you're attacking, and it gives you a, a modifier in combat. So basically you're attacking damaged uh, bombers, and the night fighters get a little bit of an edge. If you um, look at the column, if you have the charts, we're looking at the sixth column. Uh, there's one flak damage counter placed, and one flak disrupt. So the disrupt would go up on this thing. So... Just for grins, let's give this guy a disrupt value of 8, which I don't think is unrealistic by this point in the raid. So um, that would handle the flat comment, so then we can delete the marker. Wild boars would then attack, so let's just use the stacked boy. I'll, I'll ignore the others, but we'll just roll straight up. I'm not going to play any cards. Um, basically, he adds 3 for his... Uh, he adds three for his strength. He adds nothing else. Let's see, what plus one for flak down uh, if a flak damage counter is spent. There we go. So I'll delete that. So he's a plus four, and the roll of five becomes a nine. And on the wild boar stacked column, it's one more loss and another disrupt. So his disrupt would come up to nine. So you get an idea how this works. And again, you keep tracking these losses here on the on the track. All right, let's just say the other wild boars attacked and they just really didn't do anything. We can now go to the bombing procedure, which is kind of cool. John, one thing. Uh, the twin engine fighter, after having made a wild boar attack, can then try to infiltrate. Yes, it would be, in a, it would be later in the phase. It would be later on in the uh, sequence of play. You're absolutely right. Um, you would do these wild boar attacks during the raid's move phase. And this can kind of throw off new players. There, there isn't a combat phase per se. You do flak, uh, GCI, and wild boar during the, uh, the, the, the raid's move phase. The tame boar uh, phase is when you infiltrate. And since that's afterward, yeah, your, your twin engines can, uh, can try to infiltrate after they've shot things up in the, uh, the wild boar attacks. So, yeah, it could be really nasty. And then you can dog them, you know, the whole way home. So, you know, even if you get your fighters up late in a raid, don't despair because, hey, those guys have got to come back through the Himba belt and you can really mess them up on their return trip. So here's what happens with bombing. Um, in the bombing phase, which is the second to last phase of, the, of, the, of a game term, uh, if there's a drop bomb marker in a city, then what you do is you flip the thing over to its resolved bombing side and we start resolving the bombing on one of the city maps. And we're going to use city map A for check that. I'm sorry, city map B for uh, Dresden. Dresden has a B in a box there. That means it's got a normal radar signature. And let's actually the, the bombing attack happens the turn after you place that. So yeah, it wouldn't be this. It wouldn't be this yeah, turn. But I'm going to do it as though it were, just because I'm running out of time here. 
but yeah, good point. Um, you place the, the the bombing marker during the raid's move phase, and then when you get to the bombing phase, it says you resolve bombing for bombing markers currently on the resolve bombing side, uh, and then uh, remove the bombing marker. And then during the end phase, I'm sorry, it's during the end phase, you, you flip the thing over to its... Uh, uh, you, you flip bombers from drop bomb to resolve bombing. So that's that's when the flipping actually takes place. I got that backwards, sorry. Okay, now this part here, it's a, it might sound a little tedious, but it's it's actually kind of cool. Gives you a little bit of a hands-on feel to what's happening. Uh, if you click on the button on the toolbar, two buttons to the right of the coffee mug, you'll see city maps. Open up city map B is in Bravo. And what we're going to do first is we're going to place an aim point marker in an area. Probably want to pick a city center area. It has to be one of the two city center areas. Have two so we're going to put them right there. And then we're going to put an approach marker in an adjacent area. And again, direction, the little... Um, the, the little uh, compass rose up in the upper left hand corner is something that you're really only going to use in the advanced game. In the basic game, I can say the bombers are coming from any direction I want. But in the advanced game, you actually orient it um, using a semi-random process. In this case, let's say I'm hitting it from... hmm. Let's do it like this. We're going to hit it from this direction. All right, so I got my approach marker, and then I have to use a targeting method, which is based around uh, the weather. And since we have, I think, clear weather in Dresden, yeah, clear weather, uh, then we're going to place a New Haven marker to show the type of bombing that we're going to do. So we put the uh, TI in uh, the counter here in the uh, same area as the aim point. British player then rolls on the marking table to determine the drift value. So we roll two dice. And again, cards can modify this, but let's just say we don't have any cards to do, just to save time here. All right, we rolled another seven. Seem to be rolling a lot of those tonight. Uh, we roll a seven and we modify it by if a city's marked with oboe, it goes down one. Clear weather, down one. None of the other modifiers are going to apply. If there's a good radar signature, it goes down one. Bad radar signature, it goes up one. Since we're normal, uh, nothing happens there. Uh, if you have to use any of the other targeting methods besides New Haven, uh, there's going to be a modifier. It's either going to be plus one or plus three. But since we're using New Haven, there's no modifier there. So. All said and done, the only modifier that applies is the clear weather, so just a minus one, so it becomes a six, which means there's going to be a slight change here in the marking. Uh, we then roll a die for compass direction, and we move the TI counter a number of areas equal to the drift value. So the drift value here is actually going to be zero, uh, so we don't have to actually have to do that. If we had had a modified 8 or higher, it would have drifted one hex in one of those uh, six adjacent... It would have been in one of the six adjacent hexes. But since we rolled a modified 6, the drift value is 0, and there's only a slight um, change in the marking quality. Okay, so we've noted the marking quality. Um, we haven't had to move the approach marker or the targeting marker, so next step is we start dropping bombs. Now in the basic, in the ordinary game, you have a, a bomb load of 20 bomb counters. Uh, the British player chooses a mix of HE and incendiaries, and then we can put those in that coffee mug. So, oh, just for grins, let's put, let's say, 14 and 6. We'll put 14... Um, incendiaries in there and we'll put six of the others.
Okay, so I've got them loaded into the coffee mug, and now I'm going to start pulling them out here in just a moment. All right, we've determined our mix. Now in the advanced game, you can have a heavy bomb load or light bomb load, which would make the uh, the bomb counters either 24 or 16, and there's certain advantages or disadvantages by doing that. Next thing we're going to do here is we're going to look at the bomb a bomb concentration table, and we're going to look at the weather, and that's going to help um, show our, our concentration here. The weather clear shows a concentration value of 9, but earlier on when we rolled the, the, the 7 that was modified down to a 6, the marking quality column says that we're going to shift one row down. So basically uh, our concentration value now is 7. So we determine the bomb concentration value and we've modified it. We draw bomb counters equal to the concentration value from the cup and we put it in the TI area. So I'm going to draw uh, 7 counters. One, two, three. Okay, there we go. We got seven counters. We put it in the TI area. Next, you place one bomb counter in each area of the city, um, the city map, and you have to put areas adjacent to the TI first. So, drawing again from the coffee mug, we're just going to start there, 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 and there. Okay, once you've done that, then you place uh, two spaces away. So I can place there, there, there. Man, I've got a lot of bomb counters left. There. And some of these are going to fall out in the countryside and basically be worthless. So there we go. That's our, that's our bombing of the city. And next thing we're going to do, if... Uh, I think that's it. Okay, next thing we're going to do is uh, the bombing adjustment. We have to check for bombing error. We total the error value by adding up the following. Uh, visibility is not poor, so we're not going to do anything there. No poor radar signature. Nothing. Uh, the disruption table says that if we have 7 to 9 disruption, the error value is 3. And then if there's cards that are played, that could also increase it. So right now we have a, an error uh, of 3. What that means is the German player may spend those error points to move the bomb counters around. So what he can do is he can move a bomb counter like, say he wants to take this one. He can move that one out of there, that one out of there, and that one out of there take one out of the, the center area like that. Something like that. That's what he can do. So it's kind of a, an important decision for the German player. And again, I haven't played this game enough to really get a good look at, at how I ought to be doing this right here, but that's what we'll do for the demo here. Next, we check bombing accuracy. If visibility is good, the accuracy value is 2. Um, the city has good radar signature, it's 2. Um, the cards can modify this. Right now, the only, the only thing that's going to impact this is, is that we have good visibility tonight. So... Actually, no, we have moderate visibility, so never mind. Uh, there is no bombing accuracy here at all. But if we did have any bombing accuracy, what it does is it's the opposite of error. It allows the British player to then turn around and spend accuracy points to move these bomb counters back around. Okay, then after moving all the counters, the British player then converts uh, bomb counters into major fires. So in the city center, any two incendiaries turn into a major fire. So we'll take two of these out, take that one out, that one out, and we'll put a major fire in there. Looks like we, looks like we have mostly have incendiaries that landed on the TI, so those two will then turn into a major fire, and those two turn into a major fire. So we have a pretty substantial major fire here in the center of the city. Uh, residential areas, um, basically any combination of two incendiaries or one incendiary and a high explosive will uh, convert into a uh, major fire, but we don't have any of that. All right, creep back is triggered as soon as two major fires are started in the area with the TI counter. Move all remaining unconverted counters from the TI counter area to the approach area. So I 
Oops, I got a little bit ahead of myself there, so we'll actually take a major fire out. And the incendiaries, the two incendiaries that had turned into a major fire, they actually creep back to the approach area. So those are actually going to go into there. And let's see, what is in that hex? Okay, that's rail. Uh, industry and transport. Well, guess what? Three incendiaries do not create a major fire there. I'd need at least one high explosive. So uh, let's pretend, for example, that we had one high explosive that had landed there previous. Then when the two incendiaries from the, the TI area uh, creep back, all three of those counters are then removed. And a major fire is then created in the rail yard. Now, if the weather is good, you have the potential for a firestorm. If there are three or more fires in a city center area, uh, then you roll two dice. Um, and there's a chance for a firestorm. But obviously, we don't have good weather here, so no firestorm in Dresden tonight. Last thing we're going to do is the bomb scoring. In the Berlin scenario, the British player scores uh, one point for each incendiary or HE bomber uh, bomb counter dropped on a non-fields area. A fields area is one of these unlabeled hexes, basically. If it's got, even if it's got like rails like this here going through it, that's considered uh, open fields. Uh, so there's a ton of these on uh, non-open fields. So basically they're looking at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, 11 points just for the incendiaries and HEs that didn't start fires. Uh, and then four points for each major fire. So they have three major fires, so that's 12 points plus the points for the uh, the ones that didn't start major fires, which actually shouldn't have included that one. So it'd be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 22 points there scored on that bombing raid. And then you also get victory points based on the chit that was drawn for the raid. So if you look back at the... Uh, the target shit that we chose, Dresden, uh, has a value of 12, so we'd add 12 more points to the uh, British total at the end of the game for that. And that's how bombing goes down. That pretty much, ladies and gentlemen, is the game. Uh, we didn't do any recovery rolls or anything like that, but as the fighters run out of fuel, you, you do need to get them back to their air bases. And if they're not in their airbase hex when their fuel hits zero during the recovery phase, then they will try to land at a base within four hexes, and there'll be some, some penalty die roll modifiers that you have to roll on the recovery table when you have to, when you have to land in that fashion. Chances are you'll take a night fighter loss or something like that. After the night fighters land, they have to sit out a turn... I believe it takes them uh, one turn that they have to sit out before they can uh, re-scramble. And that's all, and then it's very easy to, to discover. You just go through the sequence of play and it'll walk you through that. But basically they have to go to the recovery box, then the refuel and rearm box, and then they can go back to the ready box where they can scramble again. So that is pretty much the game. Um, does anyone have any questions? Don't think I used up all ten of my mistakes tonight. I only missed a couple things. Again, this isn't uh, an exercise in good tactics because I've really only played the game a couple times, and still still enjoying uh, learning the new uh, the new tactics and strategies in the game. And I've only played the German side of things so far. So uh, I'm looking forward to playing this a little bit at GMT weekend here next week. Joel, uh, I made one observation when I started uh, checking the differences between the scenarios. Uh, it's, there is a possible error in the rule book. Uh, it doesn't affect play, but it affects the uh, setting up for the game. According to the rule book, you start uh, the um, picking of the target chip comes first, and then you decide on the environment, the weather, and etc etc visibility and such the thing is that uh, when uh, twilight affects the choice or the draw of the uh, the uh, second target so <clears throat> what I suggest is that you first uh, decide the uh, the weather and the visibility and the twilight and then draw your target sheets because otherwise you have to re redraw the target sheets if uh, it conflicts with Twilight. 
Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, I didn't mention this, I think, earlier, but in the setup, yeah, you do make a, a single die roll, and you add 10 to it, so obviously you see I rolled a 6. Uh, that's why the Twilight Marker is on the 16 box. But the Twilight Marker indicates turns where night fighters are going to start getting a big advantage because the sky is starting to lighten, um, lighten up for the, the coming morning, and if the bombers are still out there, then the night fighters are going to really chew them up. And I guess Ted's got a uh, campaign game thing. He posted some stuff, or excuse me, Lee's got a uh, campaign game thing that he's uh, posted. And I haven't had a chance to look at it, but it um, sounds like a neat idea. We're playing around a little bit with the um, combining Bomber Command, using Bomber Command essentially as a uh, scenario generator for Night Fighter, which it works very well at. Another way to look at it is using Night Fighter as a combat resolution uh, mechanic for Bomber Command. In other words, when you have a Tame Boar attack or a GCI attack or Wild Boar attacks, instead of ro rolling it out on the table here with Bomber Command, you, you get out Night Fighter and you set up a scenario with that and you play through that and the results from that game impact then this game, the, the combat result from this game. And the card cards that you play in here can then give you certain advantages than a night fighter. It's it's really kind of a slick thing. It takes a while to play. So bear in mind that one bombing raid in Bomber Command um, might involve a lot of night fighter scenarios. So it's something that would take some time to work through. I wouldn't try to tackle that in an evening. <laughs> uh, if you're just playing Bomber Command, I would say an average scenario with two players that know the game I, I can't imagine it going much longer than two hours. You don't have to wait till all the bombers make it all the way back to England. A lot of times, once they're out in the channel, um, the situation on the board may be such that uh, both players would mutually agree that uh, they're going to make it back. Uh, the bombers, not mosquitoes, but, but other bombers, do have to roll for recovery, and the more disrupts they have and flak damage that they have, the more likely it is that they will take additional losses when they uh, try to land in England. All right, guys, well, that is how uh, Bomber Command works. And again, I hope I didn't mess up uh, too many rules. <laughs> I usually end up messing up a lot of them. But I uh, appreciate the help from some of you guys that do know the game. Um, Mike and uh, Roger, thank you out. Thank you for helping me. Sten, you've been a big help tonight.